Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today. Liz and I have planned this for a long time. And uh, so um, my circumstances uh, about walking have changed a little, but that doesn't uh, impede me from talking. So um, this has been a lifelong journey for me, one that I didn't know I was taking uh, until really years after it started. Um, you heard me say that I um, heard a soldier in Vietnam. I was a young nurse, just out of nursing school, didn't know anything about anything, really. And this young man in the middle of the night came up to me. Didn't, he didn't come up to me. He asked me to come to his bed. And he said, I need to tell you something but you have to promise me that you'll believe me. And I said, well, okay, I, I promise you. And he started to tell me about his near-death experience. And the tears started rolling down his cheek, and he just was crying, and I took a hold of his hand, and I said, I understand, T tell me about this. And it was what we now know to be a very typical NDE, but at the time I had no idea what he was talking about. It was 1969, um, Raymond hadn't written his book, nobody was talking about NDEs, and so I only could support him, and I would love to be able to find this young man. Um, I told him I thought it was a wonderful gift, and that um, it was really exciting that he could talk about that. And we were able to talk about it very early. And I hope that might have made a difference for him to be able to go home and talk about it. The unfortunate thing is, in 1969 or 70, nobody would have known what he was talking about. Um, but what it did for me is it was like getting a vaccination. When I came home, I was just absolutely positive that every nurse and doctor needed to know about this so that they could support people, soldiers, other people who were having these experiences. I remember in 1971, I was just getting home, I decided to do a workshop on NDEs. Now remember, there are no books, there's no movies, there's no nothing, and I volunteered to do an all-day workshop by myself on NDEs. I have no idea what I was thinking, <laughs> because obviously that was gonna be difficult. And I invited, the only time I've ever invited a near-death experiencer, I thought, well, I better take one with me. And, you know, who knows? And so I took a 82-year-old woman who had died during childbirth. And uh, the baby was fine. She had died and was in a room and prepared because they couldn't find her husband. And they were trying to get her husband out of the field. And so she's just lying there. And the two doctors come in, and they're talking over the baby. And they said, you know, that's, he's just a private. Um, maybe one of us could adopt him. He's a very sweet baby. They're not going to be able, you know, the husband's already got a couple of kids. What are they going to do with a new baby? And all of a sudden, and this is minutes, like 20 minutes after she died, she sat up in bed and said, you're not taking care of that baby, I am. And you can imagine these doctors, then they're scampering all over the place to get fluids and do all the things that you know they thought would help, and she lived. Um, but it, it shows you the kind of remarkable circumstances sometimes that happen. What I've found since that time 
and I'm sure it's true here as well as other places, about 10% of any group are ND years, whether they say it or not, but over the years that's been pretty consistent in the general group. Do I have anybody here that would like to say they're near-death experiencers or acknowledge it? Nobody. Okay, make me a liar. That's all right. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I know that that is really true. And it's very um, difficult. When I talk about soldiers, I also sometimes bring in children. Because soldiers and children are all uh, have a difficult time because usually with children, nobody believes them. They will try one time to talk to a parent or a grandparent or a teacher, and children are just upfront. I died, I went to heaven, I saw God. And, you know, the parents said, now don't make up those stories. And, but when you really investigate these things, it is remarkable the things that they say. When I have a uh, brother who has eight children, his, hers, and theirs, and one of the second youngest ones, um, when he was about 18 months old and I was already enmeshed in this um, information, I noticed that there was something different about him. And... Um, I kept looking and I was paying attention to things he'd say or and I said to my sister-in-law I did Matthew was he sick did he have some kind of a critical event when he was born and she said yes he did he was very sick and almost died um, and of course I'm on active duty so I'm not home very much and don't know some of these things and I said, well, I think it's possible that Matt might be a near-death experiencer. And she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, just pay attention to the things he says and does because he's going to be a different kind of child. They're very smart. They're very mature. They have a very large vocabulary. But it's hard to tell when they're very young. And as he grew, I watched and paid attention. And um, when he was about three, he was having his first haircut. And um, the hairdresser was trying to talk to him and entertain him because she thought he'd be afraid or something. And so apparently Matt said, well, you, he, she asked, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he said, well... I'm going to be a minister. And she said, oh, really? Because she knew my brother didn't go to church, or not consistently. And she thought, well, this is interesting. And so when she got done, she said to my brother, Kevin, did you know Matt's going to be a minister? And my, of course, my brother's, what? And Matt said, well, what do you think? I was going to be an architect or an illustrator? And, you know, everybody just sort of, oh, my God, how does he even know these words? And, um, and life kind of went on from there. So I would talk to Matt and say, Matt, um, do you ever see different things? He said, oh, yes, God talks to me. I said, oh, really? And I would encourage him to talk. I said, what does he talk to you about and he said oh he teaches me things he tells me things to read in the bible one day he got my brother up like at six o'clock in the morning on a sunday and he said i want you to take me and buy me a white shirt and take me to church i have to see about this god thing and he was like five <laughs> and you know my brother's like what five o'clock in the morning i have to go find a white shirt and, um, and he went on a kick like that for a while. He collected all these books about God and things. And then when the, one day the Jehovah Witness came, and he went and got his books, and he said, would you like to hear about my stuff? And that, well, they just left. You know, <laughs> they didn't want to hear about that. And um, he was an incredible little boy. And 
even as a tiny little boy, my uh, things that show the intellect and the logical processing, somebody had stolen all the Christmas lights out of my mother's um, outside light. And so she went and bought some and she screwed them all in. And Matt was with her. And she said, well, I, they all work, but the blue ones don't work. And he takes my mother's hand and he said, Grandma, feel the light. It's warm. You can't see blue in the daylight. And she said, oh, okay. And he was right. And he, he was always coming up with some things like that. And kids have a very... Um, the veil's very thin for them. Uh, spiritual beings and friends, many people who talk about uh, kids having imaginary friends, they're not imaginary. They're spiritual friends. They're little spiritual beings that come to these kids. And um, about three months after my dad died, Matt's now maybe five, um, I came to my mother, my mother's a nurse also, and I said, Mom, I just want to tell you that it's not unusual that Dad might come back and show himself to you, and I don't want you to be afraid, and um, I just want you to know about these things. She said, I don't believe in any of that stuff, and I go, oh, great, this is what I do for a living, and you don't, <laughs> but I said, okay, I just wanted to let you know. And so I went downstairs to do something, and all of a sudden Matt comes right down behind me, and he said, Aunt I, Grandpa's here all the time. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's here. You know that gray sweater he used to wear all the time? That's what he's wearing, that and those old pants. And he's here, and I said, do you talk to him? He said, not talk. It comes in my brain, and then I send it to his brain which is telepathic communication, which is the way that they communicate. And I said, well, what does he look like, Matt? He said, he looks just like Grandpa, but not so thick. And I, I thought, what a great description of a, a spirit. But it was like, no big thing. He's here, he's around, we talk, and, um, but he never would have told any of us if he hadn't heard me talking about the possibility of that happen. And years after that, I used to talk to him about the, he'd tell me the light beings were there and talking to him. Fortunately, his mother's a psychiatric nurse clinician and I talked to her about it and she was fine. So she would encourage him and not do anything. My brother was like, oh, I don't know about this stuff. You know, he really wasn't quite there, but he would listen. And as Matt grew um, older, some of the after effects of a near-death experience become really relevant. Um, we come from upstate New York. A lot of people play hockey. All the boys in the family played hockey. And I said to my brother, Matt's not going to want to play hockey. He's a great skater, but he did not want to play hockey. And he said, why? I said, he will not tolerate the violence, the light, the noise. That's not him. And he's going to want to do something different, and you need to listen to him. And eventually, I think he was around 10 maybe, he decided he wanted to be a scuba diver which is very, very complicated. I did my license when I was about 25 or so, and it's a lot of math and very difficult. But he, that's what he wanted to do, and he passed it and became a scuba diver. And so there are things about the after effects that if you know about them as a grandparent or, and, and some, a lot of people say, you know, there's something a little strange about my grandson or my granddaughter, but they really don't know what it is because they're exceptional kids. And uh, things like empathy or compassion. Uh, when Matt was younger, um, my brother ordered pizza, and um, pizza came, and he asked Matt if he could borrow money out of his piggy bank 
because he didn't have any cash at home with him. And Matt said, sure, and he gave it to him. And then after everybody ate, and you can imagine eight kids um, in all this commotion eating pizza, and Matt went and kind of sat down in the corner, and my brother went over to him, and he said, Matt, what's wrong? He said, you know, those kids don't even appreciate it. They didn't appreciate the fact that I gave you the money to pay for the pizza. And it hurt his feelings. And they're very, very sensitive about things. They're very, very compassionate and have a great deal of empathy. And I talked to him as he got older and I said, Matt, some of your after effects are going to make life a little difficult for you because you, the, you're so empathetical that every little girl that is interested in you and wants somebody to take care of, you're going to want to help and do that. And you have to be careful about, you want to be uh, have empathy for everybody and compassion, but you also have to pay attention uh, to who might be taking advantage of you because they can be taken advantage very well. But even as he grew, very sweet kid, called me when I had a knee replacement and said, Aunt Di, could I come help you? How many 18-year-olds want to go help their aunt, drive them around and do all this stuff? He came. He was wonderful. He's now in the Navy. He's 25. He does not remember any of the conversations we had except the one about his grandfather. He does remember that, but not any of the light beings, the God stuff. Um, it, and that's not unusual for children who have near-death experiences. So I just tell you this in case you have children in your life that have always seemed a little off kilter, but they're really incredible kids and just need to talk about some of these things. The soldiers who have come up through the ranks and have a combat NDE, now we know Dr. Hufford, who you saw in the film, has done some research and about 50% of soldiers who have um, had a combat injury have NDEs. That's very high. And normally we think of people maybe 18, 20 percent, but 50 percent. So that is a huge issue for the military and the Veterans Association. But they really are not interested in hearing about near-death experiences. That really is amazing to me. And I have lectured um, to groups within that organizations, um, but in terms of trying to get to somebody so you could do something, because it wouldn't cost anything, really, very much. All they need is validation, somebody to listen to them, and so we could take the therapists they have, or the nurses, or somebody special, the clergy, and teach them about this, and at least they'd have a place to go because so many of the military want to stay on active duty, have a security clearance they're very afraid of losing, and many of them are getting benefits. And they somehow think that um, talking about their near-death experience, since people don't seem to understand it, is going to, they're going to lose their benefits. Uh, Glenn, you, the, the young man you saw there with the arm situation, I first, he is the first soldier that had come to me um, maybe 40 years ago now or 30 years ago. It was in the 70s, I think. Um, and he, was want, he had seen my picture in a San Antonio newspaper and knew I was in the military and knew I believed in near-death experiences. So he came to my base where I worked and was wandering around looking for me, and he looked kind of scrubby. So everybody was sort of, oh, I don't think we, you know, I don't know what's going on here. And I, when I heard his name, I finally said, you know, please let him come talk to me. 
And all he wanted to do was tell me about his experience. He said, I'd just been trying to find somebody who would listen to me. He said, I tried to talk to people in the VA. He had his arm reattached and went through a bunch of surgery. He said, but when I was in recovery and when I was in the VA, you know, I wanted to reach out and hug people. That's another after effect. They become very affectionate. And they just, it's all about love. They want to embrace people. He said nobody wanted to do that. Nobody wanted to embrace each other. And he said, I don't understand why these people don't care enough about each other. And actually, he called me a couple of months ago. He's kept up with me all these years and tells me what's going on. Uh, my dream would be to find the young man in Vietnam who probably is responsible for the rest of my life taking this path because he was very young at the time and, um, you know, just needed to talk to somebody. So we've been really working um, in IANS. I have set up a committee, so to speak, where we're going to go out and we uh, find military opportunities to talk to people. The VA, the D DAV, um, I'm going to AMSIS, which is a military organization of professional nurses, doctors, therapists, um, at the end of this month to just talk about it. Um, you'll see outside I left some uh, a flyer that has pretty much everything there is to say uh, kind of a little outline on NDEs so that you'd have that. And there also is, um, are my cards are out there. I just developed a new website. And it is uh, for the military. And if you have any veteran friends or veteran groups, please share it with him, them. And it's to provide them a sense of People have these experiences, a lot of military people have these experiences, and you can talk to us, you can call me, you can uh, write to me and, and learn something about the NDE because so many of them um, simply have not had an opportunity to talk to anybody, even now. And um, some of the people that were on the film Tony Woody, the Navy guy who was in an airplane crash, um, came to IANS, one of our conferences, and came as a bystander the first time. And I've always had, for about the last five uh, years, a uh, military discussion group where I let the ex military folks get up and talk about their experience. And Tony got up, and, for, and this is the first time he'd ever talked about his experience. In the room, you could hear a pin drop, and Tony just cried through the whole discussion of his experience because he had never had a chance to talk about it. And that is the easy part of how we could help people. We could just listen to them and just acknowledge that this was a, a, an amazing experience because the military is such a different culture. And they, um, you know, healthcare is supposed to be a closed system for all of us in civilian world now. In the military, it's not. If you had gone to a psychiatrist and tried to talk to him, your commander's going to know it. If you went to the clergy and tried to talk to them, your commander probably knows about it. So there wasn't a good way within the system, and they certainly weren't going to talk to their commanders, um, to tell somebody and feel better about it and um, still have the security of not everybody knowing about it. And you can imagine, um, especially early on, if one person knew about it, and then your rest of the troops or platoons knew, then everybody's going to know about it. And, you know, they're going to give them a hard time and tease them. Because um, as we talked about, 
people sometimes then have extraordinary skills um, that have NDEs. So you could become psychic. S uh, many of them become excellent healers. And so, um, and they're very, very smart, um, especially in math and science. Uh, with Matthew, when he got through high school, he, he was just bored to death with everything, and he'd taken as much math and science as he could. We put him in college. He hated it. He said it was boring. He already knew all this stuff. And I said to my brother, you have to find something that's going to challenge him or he's going to go down a rabbit hole that's not going to be good for him. And they actually found um, the Navy nuclear test. He would have typically not been somebody I would have thought would be good at that because he wasn't great around authority. I mean, you know, he was sort of smarter than everybody else, so he was going to tell them, usually. Um, and he did very, very well with that, and it's like 1% of the country, and it's a very small percent that get chosen, and then a much smaller percent that actually finish school. And um, he is currently, um, he has risen up and been a supervisor and he finished his education. Very, very smart. Um, but he loves his family and home. And it was too much for him to be currently, keep moving around away from his family. And um, so they sent him to Guam, uh, I think to punish him mostly. <laughs> to, and, uh, and when he gets finished with that tour, he's going to come back into civilian life and will get a job doing the same things he's doing now because he loves the work he does. Um, but it's really important to just, uh, just those simple interventions that I did because I believed him, I knew what he was talking about, and just supported that. Many young men have no idea. I was with a young man um, not too long ago and I worked with him in an organization called Purple Heart Homes. And two young men that were injured in uh, Iraq together, they joined the army together. They came um, and started this organization. And one of them is a, one was a bilateral uh, amputee. The other one had a closed head injury, uh, the invisible injury, sometimes we call it. And um, the first time I saw John get up and give a lecture, I knew. I just knew he was an experiencer. And I said, John, have you ever heard of this? And he said, no. I said, I think it's very possible you might be an experiencer, and it would be beneficial for you to talk about it, read about it, you know, know something about it. So I sent him a, you know, um, subscription to our magazine from IANS, and I'd give him a book or two here and there, because he would have outbursts of emotion, and which he couldn't really control at times. And the simplest things would touch him so. And, you know, he was trying to help everybody. It was an organization where they really were trying to find housing because there's so many veterans that don't have accommodating housing for them. And, you know, I talked about a little bit about some of the side effects, but, you know, he just didn't always see it. And it really is so important. Because he had a head injury, he did not remember any experience as it is. And that's very true for about 10% of the people. And they are the people who it's more difficult for because it's one thing if you remember this experience and you remember lifting out of your body and you remember seeing this golden light and be surrounded by love and being, um, you know, deceased loved ones and God and all these other things, then that is remarkable to you. But if you remember nothing, then you assume nothing happened. But 
the side effects will kind of creep in over time. And so that's how that happens. So it's really important for any of you who have veterans and understand why we're doing this, um, that the, the VA and uh, the medical folks are not really um, involved right now. They have a lot of problems. They have a lot of other issues they're trying to solve. Um, and I'm trying to um, make a difference wherever I can. And I think our website will make a huge difference because there's a lot of material on it. And um, hopefully all of you will take a look at it and please give a, a business card to somebody who might benefit from it, um, who you think might be an experiencer. It's been um, a journey for all these years because you just keep talking about it, talking about it, and now um, near-death experience is pretty much a common word, a household word. Um, every movie star's had one. Everyone's had one in all the soaps and all the television programs. It's, but you'll still see programs. I saw one not too long ago. It said near-death experiences. The first person was Jane Seymour who had a near-death experience and explained what it was like. The next two people, one was a truck driver who almost killed himself that had nothing to do with NDEs, and somebody else who almost killed himself. So the media still doesn't always get it right. They don't know the difference between a near-death experience phenomena and just, you know, almost coming to uh, being near death. But I think um, it's been 50 years now, um, and maybe it takes about 50 years for things to uh, boil up, and it's becoming more and more common, and I hope before my days are over that I will see um, something happen in the VA or the military that's much more positive or widespread that we could do something to help these young men and women. Because as you can tell from the film, it's devastating. And it doesn't just affect them, it affects their whole family because they have all these problems. Um, and on top of the physical injuries and the uh, PTS, now they've got this spiritual thing that they have no idea what it is. And it would be so simple to just provide some information and have stuff available for them. Um, because we, you can see by the film, and um, I've seen many, many so, uh, soldiers, and people in general who have had NDEs that are trying to get um, a, a, a hand on it. And a couple of years ago, I, I was at my Vietnam reunion, and I was sitting next to a guy, and they had nurses, doctors, and patients. And he started telling me that he'd been a patient at the hospital where I was stationed. And yet it was before I was there. And he started telling me about this thing that happened. And I mean, very quickly I realized that he'd had a near-death experience. And I said, tell me more about that experience. Well, he went into this elaborate discussion of what had happened to him. And I said, you need to come to one of our IANS conferences and speak and tell your story and have an opportunity to meet other experiencers, which is really what helps very much. And he came, and I didn't see him for a couple of days, and then he came up to me and he had a whole armful of books and he said, this has changed my life. And uh, he was a minister now. He was a pilot then. And um, he said, having these people, feeling this energy, knowing and having these people love me um, and listening to my experience, uh, I'll never be the same. And so it doesn't take a lot to kind of have this journey and then open it up so um, people can be healed. And that's what you all are doing here. You're coming, listening, 
providing information, and it's just an incredible um, period of time that you can have with people and, and really make a difference. And so that's exactly what I'm trying to do in the military. Um, sometimes one soldier or sailor at a time. Um, the woman you saw, um, Susan Geisman, is a medium. She is an ex-Navy commander. Her daughter was struck by lightning and killed. And her, she was desperate to know how to connect with her. And so she went to medium school. She went to London. There's a big school in London and went to these different places to become a medium. And she's very good. And um, she travels around the country doing programs and readings. And, but, you know, it's like everybody's led from a different point of view. And uh, losing somebody if there's a way to help somebody heal, especially with children or any lost person, um, is to have a connection through a medium, especially with children. And um, she, she does that, and she does a great job with that. And, we, and only we have to pay attention. There are some that are very good, and then there's others that aren't so good and, you know, might kind of be a sham artist in that, but I have met many that are good. So there are people coming from many different directions and doing this. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm trying to share this journey over these 50 years. And it's been, you know, while I was on active duty, I did a lot of uh, talks. And um, early on, in the first 10 years, if you can imagine, I, there's no books written, there's not a lot of stuff written, and I'm going out in, in my job talking to people at head nurses meetings and places saying, now you have to pay attention to these people that are having near-death experiences and blah, 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 and they are looking at me like I have lost my mind. And I know some of my supervisors did. They'd go, oh, God, here comes the near-death lady again. And um, uh, one time I remember going to a head nurse's meeting and giving my little spiel, and there was a particular head nurse that looked at me and like, oh, God, she's crazy. How can she be in head of education? And it wasn't maybe an hour later that she was on the phone. And she said, one of my patients had one of those things you're talking about, you better come over here. And a lot of times you would see that. It would be, you know, you drop a pearl and they pick it up and something happens to change their whole world. Nurses are very into it, kind of. They see it, they know it. Doctors are getting there, but not very quickly. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey, and at the beginning, you know, I'm trying to preach to people who have no information, and I'm just adamant that this is important. But eventually, Raymond Moody wrote his book. Now, there are hundreds of hundreds and thousands of books out there, and videos, and tapes, and movies, so... It's a very rich um, place that you can go now and get information. Well, I want to leave enough time for people who have questions about anything, NDEs, the military, children. I'm real happy to answer any questions. <laughs>